Hey guys, it's Ron. This is a, a remake of our multi-layer switch lab. Uh, I've had a lot of questions about it recently, uh, so apparently I didn't go into the depth uh, that people would have liked, so we'll try it again. So in designing my network, there's a couple little things that I like to think about and make sure that I add. Uh, so I'll talk about those uh, briefly, and then we'll get into the multi-layer switch. So the first thing I think about is a little bit of redundancy. You never know when a closet is going to overheat or it's going to lose power or somebody's going to snag a line. So you want to build in some redundancy. So I've added a second distro layer switch, which allows me to add these extra connections. Now to get that to work, I want to make sure that I'm, um, I'm doing spanning tree properly. And the proper way to do that is to make sure you identify the center of your network and make sure it has the lowest priority so that it becomes the root of your network. Okay? And then from there, move out uh, to higher priorities and then highest priorities on the access uh, kind of areas. So I have a priority of zero here. I have a priority, I think, of 4096. And then I left it the priority of like 32,000 something here. So this means that my core switch will become the root of my network. And if it fails, one of these distro switches will now become the root of my network. Okay. Now, so that allows a little bit of uh, redundancy uh, in the network. Uh, in order to get that to work, if I do a show run, I have set up, uh, let's see, spanning tree VLAN 1 through 1,000 priority 0. So again, I set this core switch to the lowest priority and then built out from there. So now I know... Uh, that uh, VLAN traffic uh, should be correct when it comes to finding the root of the network. Okay. The next thing I do is I, uh, in this case, I set up VTP. Uh, so this is a VLAN trunking protocol. Uh, I set my core switch up as the server, and then everything else is a uh, is a client. I set up if I do a uh, show VTP status. You'll see that I created a domain name. Uh, I left this one as the server, uh, and then I also added a password. So each of these has a matching domain name and password, and they are all clients. So when I create a VLAN for my core switch, it automatically uh, gets replicated down into all my other switches. What this enables me to do is to eliminate uh, a little bit of carelessness in creating my VLANs. Let's say I added a, another a group of computers down here and I decided they're going to be VLAN 50. So I added VLAN to the floor uh, 4 switch. I added it to distro switch 2 and I added it to switch 1. But I forgot to add it to distro switch uh, 1. So in this case uh, I'm using the connection to distro switch 1 and then from distro switch 1 to core switch 1. You'll notice green and green. But I've got a red and green up here because spanning tree uh, disabled this connection. So for all intents and purposes, I think VLAN 50 is good to go. They're able to talk throughout the network. They're able to work. Then at some later point, uh, distro switch 2 fails. Well, because I forgot to create VLAN 50 up here, all of a sudden when uh, Span and Tree kicks in and enables this connection, uh, VLAN 50 is not going to be able to be passed up to my core switch and I'm gonna run into some issues so by enabling VTP and ensuring that VLAN 50 gets added uh, to every one of my switches you know I can I can eliminate some of those uh, trip ups in my network another thing I like to think about is management and a little bit of security so in my core switch here if I do a show VLAN by default uh, VLAN 1 is typically used for your management, okay? And it's also the default for every port. Well, that's a problem. Uh, I don't want somebody to plug a, a device in to one of the ports that I have, uh, I have not configured yet, and all of a sudden they might be able to see some of the, the management traffic or they might be able to inject some management traffic. Wh whatever the, the case is, that's, that's not a, a good scenario. So instead what I did was I created this VLAN 500 for my management and it was not added to any ports. Okay? It's, ju it's just a VLAN 500 name management and then I also created an interface VLAN uh, 500. So if I do show IP interface 
brief, you see that VLAN 500 has an IP, whereas VLAN 100 has no IP, or VLAN 1 has no IP, and it is administratively down. Okay? So now I've created that interface VLAN 500 here. I've also created an interface VLAN 500 to uh, all of these uh, uh, all of these other switches. So now I can use that to telnet uh, from my core uh, to each of the different switches. So now I can manage all of these switches out there uh, remotely, okay? Because I'm not going to want to have to run around the entire building and console in to every single device that I've got. I want to be able to remote into them. Well, going along with the security portion of it, uh, Telnet is unencrypted, okay? And uh, let's say I, I just want to play it safe and I don't want to uh, assume that my users are going to do the right thing. So I want to make sure that that uh, management traffic is encrypted, okay? So to do that, if I do a show run, go all the way to the bottom here, I've got uh, my line VTY. So this is my, uh, my terminal interfaces. I'm using transport input SSH, okay? So now uh, I am encrypting management traffic, or I have to use SSH in order to establish a connection to this switch, okay? Now there's a couple other things I have to set up to get SSH to work, like I have to give it a domain name. Uh, I went ahead and set it to version 2, and then I need to generate my crypto keys. So crypto keys are really easy, so you can do uh, config T, crypto key uh, generate RSA and that's that's it and then it's going to ask you how many bits you want to use for the key in my case uh, I went ahead uh, because I was using version 2 uh, I went ahead and specified that uh, I need uh, a 768 keys okay the default is 512 uh, but uh, it's not going to let you use 512 for version 2 not a big deal. So now, whenever I try to uh, remote into one of my other devices, if I do a telnet, 172.31.255.4 is one of my floor switches, it automatically boots me out. It's not allowing uh, that unencrypted connection. But if I do an SSH, and I'm going to specify a username because I know I'm using a local user account over there, Cisco. So 172.31.255.4 again. Now it prompts me for a password. Cisco123 dollar sign. And then I also put in an enable password. So it's just an extra step, an extra layer of security. Uh, I think it's secret123 dollar sign. Wonderful. And now I can manage that switch just like as if I was setting at the device. Okay. Now... Uh, if you notice in here, there's this IP default gateway. That's for my management VLAN. So this is the interface VLAN 500 on my core switch. So that has to be in there in order for me to get from that access layer switch back to the core. All right, And that's just for that VLAN 500. Okay. Also, again, transport input SSH. Login local. So I'm using the local username. Uh, there's my enable secret and then my username. And again, I'm using all secret, so this is MD5, not uh, Cisco's proprietary that you can break. Okay, so we'll go ahead and log out, and we're back in our core switch. Okay, now to get more into the uh, uh, actual multi-layer kind of settings, uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take tasks that were originally uh, being accomplished by the router and kind of offload them on another device so that I can free up some resources here. All right? There's no reason why this router has to see traffic from the internet and traffic on my local VLAN or on my local network. Because prior to the old scheme was we had sub interfaces on our, our uh, router here. So anytime you wanted to talk from this VLAN to that VLAN, it had to go up hit the sub-interface, uh, the router would uh, drop it to the other sub-interface, and it would go back out for that VLAN. Uh, again, you're asking your router to do a lot, okay? 
it, it's doing all the outside stuff and all the inside stuff. So instead, I'm going to offload some of those tasks on my core switch. Okay, and what I've done, if I do a show run, I've enabled IP routing. Okay, and what this enables me to do, oops, is now uh, I can do things like this on my on one of the interfaces. I can do a no switch port, and then I can add an IP address. In the uh, other switches, you're not going to be able to do that. Okay. But on this multi-layer switches or multi-layer switch, I can do a no switch port, add an IP address. So now I have a layer three connection in between my core switch and my router, and I have a layer three connection between my core switch and my server here. Okay. So uh, we're not creating a trunk, we're not relying on sub interfaces, and we're not relying then now uh, on the uh, router here to uh, worry about local traffic. Now local traffic, if I keep going down, I've got all these interface VLANs. Now local traffic between one VLAN and the next comes up to the core switch. And the core switch, being a multi-layer switch, is able to go from VLAN 10 to VLAN 20. So again, this local traffic never has to go up to uh, my main router here. Okay? So Again, that, that just frees up some resources here uh, that you uh, normally would be using. Okay. Now I've also specified an IP helper address. Okay. So again, we're it's it's divide and conquer here. Uh, whenever any of my hosts request DHCP, it's going to come here to the VLAN. It's going to use that IP helper address to kick it back up to the server. Okay. And so my server. Then, as my DHCP uh, server has all the VLANs already built into it, okay? You know, I've 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 created these uh, so that again, my core switch and my router don't have to worry about uh, DHCP at all, okay? And again, we're just freeing up resources here. Now, on a large network, anyway, you're going to want a server. You know, the the I have seen the DHCP uh, servers on uh, a router uh, freak out, and I've had to reboot routers. I've had to, you know, do, you know, different things. Whereas the servers tend to handle the heavy load a lot better. Okay, so as your network grows, for a very small network, yeah, it's it's fine. You can run it off of the switch here, or the multi-layer switch, or you could run it off the router, what have it. But as your network grows, you're going to want to have an actual dedicated DHCP server, which is what I've done uh, in this network. Now, because I have a, a layer 3 connection in between my router and my switch, uh, I know I'm no longer relying on trunking uh, and sub-interfaces to pass traffic. So I have down here a couple of IP route statements. Okay. Now, I've had a lot of questions about this this one in particular. It's just a basically a default route, uh, and the reason that it's here is if I'm doing VLAN to VLAN traffic, it's going to hit here, and it's already the the multi-layer switch because it has those interface VLANs. It's already going to know where to send the traffic. However, let's say one of these uh, one of these VLANs, one of these hosts out here, wants to access something on the internet. Well, the multi-layer switch doesn't know how to get there, so it's going to use this default route, and this default route just points to the router. Okay. Now, I could have uh, done some a dynamic routing protocol in between the two, but again, for a, a network like this, uh, the static routes are going to work great. You know, uh, the, it's less overhead, uh, it's less processing that the the switch and the router have to do. Now, if I'm building a connection from this router uh, to, say, uh, another network, uh, and I've got tunnels in between them uh, and things like that, and people may uh, be bringing up one network and then bring it down, move into a different location, bring it back up, I'm definitely going to want a... Uh, a uh, dynamic routing protocol. But in this case, in between the two right here, 
not much is is really ever going to change. So the static routes are are a better option than using a dynamic routing protocol. All right, and then I also uh, this one is just I was playing around with some more management stuff. So now I can get to uh, I had a loopback address uh, assigned on on this router. Uh, but anyway, the the main one that you need is this IP route, uh, this default to pass it up to the router. And then if we go to the router itself, Cisco Cisco one two three dollar sign enable secret one two three dollar sign. If I do a show run here, and I go to the bottom here, I've got uh, I've got a couple different IP routes. Now. All of my uh, VLANs here are slash 25s, which means uh, uh, they have a 128 subnet mask. So by specifying these two IP routes, I'm actually covering all four VLANs. Okay, And so all I'm doing here is telling uh, the router about these VLANs. Now again, it doesn't participate in any of this local traffic, but let's say uh, this computer wants to talk to the internet. If he goes to ping uh, the server out here, NAT is going to be applied because I have it set up on the router. So everything going out is going to be hunky dory. But when it comes back and NAT gets stripped off and it returns to the to the original IP, this router needs to know where to send it next. So what this does uh, is passes that traffic to the multi-layer switch. All right, so now it enables two-way communication. Okay, without those two static routes in there, my traffic would get out, but when it comes back, the router would end up dropping it. Okay, because it wouldn't know where to send it. And then, uh, like I said, I've got NAT set up, so I've got my access lists that grab up this this uh, traffic, and then I've got my uh, my NAT statements, and then I've got uh, uh, on my two interfaces, this is to my ISP, so it's my outside interface. Uh, this is my connection to the switch, so it's my inside interface. Uh, pretty standard uh, NAT implementation. But the big thing is, is that all this local traffic never has to go beyond this switch. It never has to bother uh, the router. Also, all the DHCP requests never have to go to the router. Okay, they're being sent right here to the server. So again, that enables uh, this router to just really worry about stuff that has to go to the internet and from the internet back. All the local traffic is kept separate. Okay, and then I've just got static routes in between them rather than a dynamic routing protocol that would cause uh, a lot of overhead. Okay, so that's pretty much it for the lab. Uh, again, Things that I think about are redundancy, so I need to worry about spanning tree. Uh, my VLAN implementation, so in my case, I did VTP. Uh, I need a little bit of security and management, so I created a, a separate VLAN rather than using VLAN 1. Uh, I'm using transport input SSH rather than uh, Telnet. Um, I'm using IP helper uh, addresses to point to a DHCP server. Uh, I'm using a multi-layer switch to kind of segregate uh, this local traffic and keep it off of the router. Uh, and then I'm using static routes in between them uh, rather than a dynamic routing protocol. So hope uh, you got something uh, valuable out of the lab, and uh, I appreciate you watching.